As you take your seats, please open to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. And we'll continue with our series on the law of worship. If you'll remember, we're looking at the first four commandments, those vertical commandments, and trying to understand what it is that they have to teach us about worship. We've looked at an overview of the commandments, we've sort of laid a theological foundation, and then we've taken a couple of weeks to look at commandment number one. We're going to try to do each of these in a couple of weeks. And today we'll look at commandment number two, beginning at verse four. And you shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Amen. A couple of things to notice here. I want you to notice the connection of the commandments. Oftentimes when we think about the Ten Commandments, we think about them as though they are ten uh, isolated commandments and that they're not connected to one another. Or, at best, we'll think about maybe the, the first table um, and then the second table, but not think about the relationship even between those, let alone between the commandments themselves. But I think when we look at the first and second commandment, it becomes obvious for a number of reasons that there is a connection. First, look at the structure here. If you look at the structure, you see an A, B, B, A structure. In the first commandment, it is you shall not, followed by I am. In other words, you shall not have any other gods before me. Or, or in this commandment, it's, it's you shall not follow by I am. But in the first commandment, it was I am, and then a, therefore you shall not. In this commandment, again, you shall not make any carved images. You shall not bow, bow down to them. Why? I, the Lord your God, am. First commandment, I am the Lord your God, brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And because of that, you shall have no other gods before me. So we go from I am, therefore you shall not, to you shall not, because I am. The same idea. The second thing is this. Essentially, God has already said, you shall have no other gods. He's already said, you shall not worship other gods. And yet, here in the second commandment, it seems as though he's saying the same thing. Because in many ways, he is. The first commandment deals with the idea of having other gods. The second commandment deals with the idea of worshiping in accordance with someone or something other than God, allowing your worship to be changed or dictated. Remember, this is about the law of worship and what the commandments teach us about worship. Note that the worship of God flows from the very character of God. It does not begin with us and then get its shape and form because of who we are and how we feel. It begins with God and gets its shape and form because of who he is and what he says. We worship God because he's God. We worship God the way God determines he is to be worshipped because he is God. Remember the definition of worship that we're working from, that definition from Bruce Leafblad. True worship happens when we set our minds, attention, and hearts affection on the Lord, praising him for who he is and for what he has done. Again, these first commandments make it very clear. Why? First of all, here's who I am. Therefore, 
here's what you shall not do. And the second commandment, here's what you shall not do. Why? Because here's who I am. We worship God in light of who he is and what he has done. But secondly, remember we talked about the law of worship. And here's a definition that we're kind of working from as we go through this series. Every man must worship the one true God rightly, reverently, and regularly. From the first commandment, we get the idea that every man must worship the one true God. Not worshiping God is not an option for any man. From the second commandment, we get the idea that man must worship the one true God rightly. Again, we've already established that we must worship the one true God and only the one true God. So here, when we come to the second commandment and we're looking at graven images and things of that nature, he's not saying now that this is about having another God. Those things aren't gods, by the way. This commandment has to do with the one true God being worshipped rightly. The third commandment, honoring the Lord's name or not taking his name in vain, is about the Lord being worshipped reverently. And the fourth commandment, the commandment about the Sabbath, is about the Lord being worshipped regularly. So it's from these commandments that we get our definition. Finally, there's the idea of normative versus regulative worship. Remember, normative worship is the idea that we, we worship God uh, according to what we find in Scripture, but we can also use other things as long as they're not forbidden in Scripture. Remember the Lutheran view. Essentially, Luther wanted to keep the, Roman, the essence of Roman Catholic worship, but get rid of anything in Roman Catholic worship that was expressly forbidden in Scripture. Whereas the Puritan view, the Calvinistic view, was that we must worship God. This is the regulative principle. We must worship God only in the ways that he has expressly commanded us in his word. Nothing else. There are no other options. We have a tendency two tendencies when it comes to the second commandment. One is over-literalizing the second commandment, and the other is over-spiritualizing the second commandment. And there's a ditch on both sides of the road. When we over-literalize the second commandment, here I don't refer to it being a problem of taking Scripture literally. We all recognize here that we take the Scriptures literally where they're intended to be taken literally. Amen? Uh, I love when people ask, are you one of those people who takes the Bible literally? And my answer usually when somebody asks me that is where I'm supposed to, right? What, what they want you to do is say, yes, I take the Bible literally. And then they'll bring up something that's obviously figurative in Scripture. And they say, well, how can you possibly take the Bible? No. Do you take the Bible literally? And my answer is, yes, where I'm supposed to. And that kind of confuses people. Well, what do you mean? I said, well... When the Bible says that God covers me with his wings, I don't believe that that means he's a big chicken. But when it says you shall not commit murder, I do believe that that means I should not kill you no matter how much you annoy me with such questions. So be very happy that I take the Bible literally where I'm supposed to. So I'm not talking about the fact that we don't take the Bible literally. But we can be literalistic in our understanding of the second commandment. And if we become literalistic in our understanding of the second commandment, we believe that the only way you can violate it is by making an actual physical idol. And you say, well, I haven't built any idols. Therefore, I'm not guilty concerning the second commandment. And the fact of the matter is, it goes much further than that. We see this, for example, in the history of Israel. We see this in the Levitical law and in the way the Levitical law teases out the second commandment, specific admonitions to Israel about their worship that are rooted in the second commandment, but that are very specific to them, for example. The other idea is the over-spiritualizing of the second commandment. And here... The error is to turn everything into an idol. We see idols everywhere. In fact, there's no other sin. We see someone who's successful and wealthy 
wearing, driving, or living in something nice or expensive, and immediately we assume, ah, idolatry. We see someone who has a hobby that they take very seriously, and immediately, ah, idolatry. We see someone who's overweight and not taking care of themselves, and we say, ah, food is an idol. We see someone who's in really good shape and taking care of themselves, and we go, ah, their body's an idol. Everything becomes idolatry. The truth of the matter is idolatry is a matter of the heart. There's a helpful definition of this. If I can find it. Essentially, well, you know what's going to happen is I'm going to find it later on and I'll read it to you then. But essentially, idolatry is a matter of the heart. The question is, what are we trusting in ultimately? And anything that we are trusting in ultimately becomes an idol. Anything that we're putting our faith in becomes an idol. Anything that we believe has ultimate power becomes an idol. Anything that we believe controls our destiny becomes an idol. Anything that we cannot do without, cannot live without, cannot imagine life without becomes an idol. And so you can see where when we make this a matter of the heart, It's not just that you can have physical things that are idols. You can. You can have physical things that are idols, but they don't necessarily have to be. You can also have other things in your life that become idols, that whole list of things that we just talked about. It's not necessarily true that people's nice things are idols, but it is necessarily true that they can become idols. It's not necessarily true that food can be somebody's idol or a hobby can be somebody's idol or somebody's body can become an idol or somebody's anything can become an idol. All of those things can become idols. But idolatry is a matter of the heart. And see, when we over-literalize idolatry or over-spiritualize idolatry, what we are usually trying to do is mask the idolatry in our own heart. Is there something that has become an idol to me? Well, the more I become aware of it, the more I want to over-literalize and say, well, you know, I haven't made anything physical that looks like an idol. Is there something that I have physical that's become an idol to me? Well, then I want to over-spiritualize. In other words, I want to guard myself from acknowledging my own guilt as it relates to idolatry. This means that we must apply this differently. Listen to this. From the book Going Beyond the Five Points. Things have changed due to fulfillment in Christ, but fulfillment does not cancel the moral principle of the law, though it may change its application. In other words, the application of the second commandment looks different than it used to in light of the coming of the Son of Man and his entrance into glory. We worship how we do in light of the coming and resurrection of Christ. I want to give you one particular example of that. There are things that would have been violations for Israel in light of the principle of the second commandment that would not necessarily be violations for us. The second commandment is given to Israel in the midst of the ancient Near East. And in the midst of the ancient Near East, the idea of worship and the idea of gods was very different. People carved their gods. People carried their gods around. People did things, for example, to their bodies. They marked themselves in ways that identified them with the God whom they worshipped. And so I had an interesting encounter once with um, a, a gentleman, and it went something like this. 
he was pointing out that someone in a particular church where we were, a person who had come out of a different kind of lifestyle and God had saved him, he's pointing out the fact that this person had a number of tattoos on him. And I said, yeah, I, yeah, he does. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of, a lot of tattoos. Um, some of them pretty nice, pretty nice artwork on, you know. He's like, ah, how can you, the artwork, who cares about the artwork? The Bible is clear that you, that you, you should not do that. The Bible couldn't be clearer about that. And so I said, oh, you mean in Leviticus 19? He said, yes. So we opened up to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 28. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right there. That's pretty clear. I said, yeah, it is, but may not mean what you think it means. Why? Well, if it does, you're in trouble. Verse 27 of Leviticus 19. You shall not round off the hair on the temples or mar the edges of your beard. This man was clean shaven. Now, either you have a huge issue here because you're holding that person accountable to Leviticus 19.28, but you have excused yourself from Leviticus 19.27, hypocrite, or that text doesn't mean what you think it means. You see, specifically, Leviticus chapter 19 in this section here dealing with the cutting of the beards and the tattooing and cutting of the body has to do with practices of neighboring peoples who did these things to identify themselves as worshipers of their pagan deities. It didn't have anything necessarily to do with your beard and what you do with it or whether you have one or necessarily with whether or not there were things drawn on your body. It had to do with idolatry and identifying with foreign deities, which meant that it was rooted in the principles of the second commandment. Now, does that mean that somehow the second commandment no longer applies to us? Absolutely not. It most assuredly does. But the second commandment has to be applied in light of the person and work of Christ. And this is incredibly important. If you'll remember when we started all this, one of the things we said was that the Old Testament is very difficult for us because we don't know how to interpret it and apply it. And we think that you just run over to the New Testament, you find a verse, you rip it, kicking and screaming it out of its context, bring it into your situation, and boom, that's the way you do it. Well, then you run into... They violated verse 28, and you violated verse 27. What do we do? Or there's a way that we look at the Bible as a whole, understanding that Christ is our ultimate hermeneutical principle, understanding something called biblical theology, and that God has revealed himself progressively through biblical theology, and try to approach it that way. And that's what we're trying to do here. So when we look at the commandment, the second commandment against graven images, it's important that we understand it in light of all of redemptive history. That's what our forebears in the Westminster Larger Catechism did. And remember, when we do this, we're looking at the Westminster Larger Catechism. When we, when we, when we look at this, we want to do two things. One, we want to make it clear I want you to see the sinfulness of your sin. I want to see the sinfulness of my sin. Because what we like to do is we like to look at the commandments like the rich, rich young ruler, you know. The rich young ruler looks at Jesus and he says, ah, I've kept all of those from my youth. <laughs> Liar. No, you haven't. And the only way that you could possibly believe that you've kept these commandments is if you don't understand the magnitude of the commandments. So I want you to understand the magnitude of the commandments. The second thing is when we understand the magnitude of the commandments, we understand the magnitude of the righteousness of Christ because he did indeed keep the commandment. Remember that what the Westminster divines were doing in the larger catechism was taking a 
biblical theological view of the commandments and looking at everything that God has revealed in all of scripture about the heart of this part of the moral law and answering the question, what are the sins forbidden in the second commandment? Listen to this. When you take all of the Bible as a whole related to the moral principle behind the second commandment, here's the answer to that question. The sins forbidden in the second commandment are all devising, counseling, commanding, using, and anywise approving any religious worship not instituted by God himself, tolerating a false religion, the making any representation of God, of all or of any of the three persons, either inwardly in our mind or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness or any creature whatsoever, all worshiping of it or God in it or by it, the making of any representation of foreign deities and all worship of them or service belonging to them, all superstitious devices, corrupting the worship of God, adding to it or taking from it, whether invented from others, though under the title of antiquity, custom, devotion, good intent, or any other preference or pretense. Whatsoever, simony, sacrilege, all neglect, contempt, hindering and opposing the worship and ordinances which God has appointed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. And, and in case you don't understand it there, here's what you understand. When Jesus is asked what is the greatest commandment, he summarizes the first four commandments. And he says the first and greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You've never done that for one nanosecond in your entire life. Which means you've never kept any of the first four commandments, let alone the second. We are guilty. And yet, Christ was righteous. In this regard, he never in his earthly life and ministry violated the second commandment in word, in thought, or in deed. You see, when we say that Jesus was pure and holy and righteous, we don't just mean that he never did any of the big things. He never did any of the smallest of things. There was no sin found in him. So with that in mind, let's look at the text here. And there are a couple of things that I want us to see. First, let's look at the you shall nots. There's two you shall nots. You shall not make and you shall not bow. Look at the first one in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is under the earth. You shall not make any carved images. Again, God is not afraid that these other things are actually God's or will compete with him. For example, in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 8 through 11, listen to what he says. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witness Uh, Excuse me, their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. These things are not gods. That is not his point. But remember, this is about a matter of the heart. This is about things being allowed in your heart to compete with the place of God. That is where the problem comes in. A great example of this 
is when Paul talks about eating meat sacrificed to idols. He says the, the idols, nothing. It doesn't bother him. Paul has no problem eating meat sacrificed to idols because he doesn't believe in the idols. But he recognizes that there are individuals who worship those idols and for whom that idol means something that it does not mean to me. I've heard of many a story of people leaving their own culture and going to another culture. Let's say somebody leaves here and they go to India or somewhere else in Asia. Somebody leaves there and comes here somewhere in Africa. And like we often like to do when we go visit other cultures, we like to bring something home. And well, on a number of occasions, people go and they visit. And oftentimes one of the things you bring home is something that's been carved somewhere right? And so, you know, you get that and you come back home and there's this beautiful art piece that you found on your visits around the world and you put this art piece in and then all of a sudden there's somebody who comes and visits you from your church and you find out that they're from that place and you go, oh, I visited that place. Got a wonderful piece of art from that place. And they come to your house and you show them the piece of art and their jaw just drops. What is it? Is it not good? I thought it was good. I thought this was, you know, do do you know what that is? Well, obviously not. That's an idol. And in my country, in my culture, that's worshipped. People bow down to that. Now let me ask you a question. Has the person who bought it committed a sin? No. No. Because they're not worshiping the idol. Do do you follow? This is what Paul means when he says, for him, it's no big deal. Eating meat sacrificed to idols. And this is not about eating meat. So when he says, if eating meat offends my brother, I will not eat meat. That is not about eating meat. It's about idolatry. And the point is that idolatry is in the heart. God is not concerned about a piece of wood competing with him. Amen? Amen? Ask the prophets of Baal. God is not concerned about that. The concern here is the hearts of God's people and the corrupting of the worship of the one true and living God. That's the issue. These things are not God's. They're nothing. They're nothing. Let me take this a step further. There may be people, say, for example, in, you know, random country like Zambia, who come from a particular background, maybe a particular tribe, and in their particular tribe, there is a belief that certain charms and images have power. Let's say, just hypothetically. And let's say that hypothetically this person from Zambia comes out of that and actually becomes a Christian. And so they, they no longer utilize such things. However, when somebody threatens them with one, they get scared. They just violated the second commandment. Because even though they didn't carve the image, even though they don't possess the image, they fear the image in the way that only God is to be feared. That's idolatry. Are you smelling what I'm stepping in? Is it getting real enough for us now? That's idolatry superstitions, things that we believe have power that only belongs to God, that's violating the second commandment. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Can we get even more specific? I've had people to complain because I use this and not a book. Ah. Ah, these... These, these newfangled preachers, right? I guess, I guess it's new Calvinist, whatever, you know. 
coming up with their, you know, with their electronic versions of the Bible. But guess what? Now it's, you've got an electronic version of the Bible, not a paper Bible. Guess what it used to be? It used to be you have to use the big giant pulpit Bible. I can remember when I first started preaching. I, there were a number of churches that I walked into and I opened up my Bible and put it on top of the pulpit Bible and people were like, Mm -mm. Then I've had people who've seen my Bible actually written in and marked up. Folks, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. That book with ink printed on paper, that's not God. Amen, somebody. That's not God. Do you see how deep this goes? How significant it can be? Now, again, I'm not saying that if you have a Bible that's important to you, that that's automatically idolatry. I, I, have, I have a Bible that's important to me. I have a Bible that, you know, and it, the cover's falling all off of it. It's when I became a believer a couple of young men who were discipling me, who were teaching me how to read the Bible and understand it, they gave me a Bible and wrote a note to it, note in it to me when I was 18 years old. And I have it. It's meaningful to me. However, it, it doesn't have power. Amen? It doesn't have power. I, I, I don't believe that, that I can blaspheme against that particular leather-bound paper and ink. Do you see, idolatry is a matter of the heart. The second commandment is about turning our heart in the wrong direction. Our trust in the wrong direction. Our fear in the wrong direction. Our faith in the wrong direction. Listen to what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 1. That familiar passage in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For the invisible attribute, uh, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see what they did? They exchanged the glory. The point is not that they made something. The point is that they exchanged the glory. You shall not exchange the glory. The second thing, the second you shall not. So first you shall not make. Secondly, you shall not bow. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. Here's where we get into our worship. You shall not worship those things. You shall not bow down to those things. First of all, don't make those things. The idea here is that we are giving over to those things. Secondly, don't have your worship dictated by those things. The only one who can dictate our worship is God himself. Amen? No one and nothing else can dictate our worship. You shall not bow down to them. We see these in Exodus 32. Same book, a few chapters later, and it's rather amazing, right? We, we get the Ten Commandments and we get the mountain and smoke and fire and all that. You would think... That after all of that, that it would be generations before you had a problem with idolatry. Amen? Woo! Long, 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 long to hundreds of years before. No, no. Moses goes back up on the mountain and he takes too long. 
and they build the golden calves. And while he's up on the mountain, chapter 32, verses 7 through 10, the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people. I, I love this. There's so many things in Exodus 32 that when you read it carefully, I just, I love this. They make the idol, and he doesn't say, my people. He says, Moses, you need to go see about your people. Whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, he said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, right? He said that, right? Now, they're down there worshiping the golden calf. He's like, Moses, you better go see about your people. You know those people that you brought out of Egypt? They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. God is serious. He's serious. Now we know that that is not what happens. A number of them are consumed. The ground opens up and swallows them. God demonstrates his wrath, but God also rescues his people. God reminds his people that he is serious about idolatry, which leads us to the next part of this. And this almost needs its own sermon, but we're going to deal with this because we have to do this in two sessions. We have the that you shall not, you shall not make, you shall not bow. Um, but, but, but why? And essentially, it's because I am. The last one was, I am, uh, because I am, you shall not. I am the Lord your God, you shall not have any other gods. This one, you shall not make, you shall not bow. Why? Because I am. And again, it is I, the Lord your God. And that phrase, the Lord your God, is connecting it to the first commandment. This is not isolated from the first commandment. It doesn't make sense without the first commandment. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Here's the first problem. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And we hear that and we go, wait a minute. Here's what the wrong reasoning does here. The wrong reasoning says, well, jealousy is a sin. Right? Deadly sin, man. Envy, right? Jealousy, that's, that's a sin. Here, God says he's jealous. Therefore, God's a sinner. That's a problem, right? Um, not exactly. We see this in other places. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Again, in Deuteronomy 6.14, we see God identified as a jealous God. But is this always sinful? No. No. In Numbers chapter 11 and in Numbers chapter 25, we see that Phineas was jealous for God's glory. And Phineas was not sinful when he was jealous for God's glory. We see this in 1 Kings 19, that Elijah identifies himself to God as having been jealous for God. And so obviously, we're talking about something else here. Folks, understand this. Jealousy, the sin of jealousy occurs when I am envious of somebody else's power, place, position, or possessions because I believe wrongly that what they have ought to be mine. That's jealousy. You have possessions, position, power, 
praise that I want for myself. And I'm jealous because you have it and I want it for myself. Essentially, me being jealous is accusing God of not knowing how to distribute gifts. I'm accusing God of wronging me because you have some position, some possession, some praise, something, some power that I want and I want it wrongly because it's not mine. Newsflash, all power belongs to God. All position comes from God. All praise is to be to God and all possessions belong to God. Therefore, God is supposed to be jealous, but it's more significant than that. If God were not jealous, then that would mean that God believed there was someone or something more worthy than him, which would mean God was being an idolater. It is not sinful for God to be a jealous God. It would be sinful for God not to be a jealous God. But that's only part of the problem. The other part of the problem, and we'll do this quickly. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Here's the second issue that we deal with. And and this is the issue of what some would call generational curses. Again, very popular idea. The popular idea of the generational curse, right? Um, you, you, you do something or you experience something or you suffer from something, and, and the response to that is, well, it's a, it's a generational curse. Or somebody in your family has done something, your father, your grandfather has done something, and all of a sudden you're afraid. Why? Because of a generational curse. And you think you have justification for believing in the idea of a generational curse because right, right here it says he, he, he visits the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation, right? I mean, there it is, right there in black and white, a generational curse, um, except it's not a generational curse. Let me explain it to you two ways. First, let, let me t- listen to this from the IVP background commentary. Punishment to the third and fourth generation is not granted to human judges, but to God. It expresses the fact that covenant violations bring guilt on the entire family. The third and fourth generation is then a way to refer to all living members of a family. But there's also a contrast in the loyalty that is extended to thousands and generations over against the punishment that extends only to three or four. This is a figure of speech. Third and fourth generation is a reference to all the living members of your family. This sin will affect not only you, but all the living members of your family, which is very interesting because in the fourth commandment, the fourth commandment talks about you and your children and your servants and all the members of your household. What is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment tells children to honor their father and mothers so that they can live long on the land. Listen, the commandments are connected. The idea here is that this is covenant promise and that when you talk about covenant promise, covenant promise has an impact and it is and can be a multi-generational impact. But there is a difference between the idea that what you do will impact generations to come and the idea that there is a curse on generations. So first, there's a theological explanation But secondly, I want to give you a biblical explanation. Ezekiel chapter 18. Please turn there. Ezekiel chapter 18. And we've had to deal with this because as as an adoptive family, for example, we have children who come into our family through adoption. There are Christian people who warned us, aren't you afraid? Afraid of what? Well, you might adopt a child who has a generational curse. And you wouldn't even know. Wait, what? What what are you saying? If I believe that, we wouldn't have had kids. Because I know what's in my family the last three generations. Amen, somebody, right? If 
If I was afraid of generational curses, I never would have had kids at all. But the second problem is that is grossly unbiblical. Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountain or lift up his eyes to idols, the house of Israel does not defile his neighbor's wife but, uh, or approach a, a woman in her time of mystical impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores uh, uh, to, uh, to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked with a garment, does not, um, excuse me, Lend an interest or take any profit without his, uh, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. His righteousness, uh, he is righteous, I'm sorry. He shall surely live, declares the Lord. If he fathers a son who is violent, sheds uh, a shedder of blood, so on and so forth. Go down to verse 13. Lens takes a prophet. Shall he then live? He shall not. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. His blood shall be upon himself. He continues on in Ezekiel 18, basically to say, Father sins. I don't punish the child. There's no multi-generational curse. There's generational influence, absolutely. We grow up in our households, we learn things, and we tend to live in accordance with the things that we've learned. There is absolutely influence. But the idea of a multi-generational curse, God says clearly in Ezekiel 18, he says to Israel, stop believing that and stop teaching that. There are no generational curses. By the way, believing in and being afraid of generational curses is another example of violating the second commandment. Because you are conferring God's power on something that's not God. You're also accusing God of doing something that God doesn't do. You are not cursed. Here's the third and final problem with the idea of the generational curse. What about the blood of Jesus? Huh? Do you mean to tell me that the blood of Jesus can save me from my sin, can save me from death, hell, and the grave, but it can't save me from my father's sin? I'm saved and on my way to heaven, but I'm cursed? Because of my grandfather? That is utterly and absolutely ridiculous. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Jesus saves to the uttermost. To the uttermost. Confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Well, Except the generational curses that you inherited from your father or your grandfather. No, 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 a thousand times no. Ezekiel 18 screams no, no. So when you look at Ezekiel 18, and then when you take the fact that this is a very familiar construct, the third and fourth generation, when you understand that, It's obvious that what's being spoken of there is not the idea of a generational curse, but it's the idea of the significance of covenant promises and our covenant responsibility. So again, connect this to the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment. 
and the covenantal duties and responsibilities, the responsibility that we have to our children. Deuteronomy chapter 5 repeats the Ten Commandments, and right after Deuteronomy chapter 5 comes what? Deuteronomy chapter 6. What is Deuteronomy chapter 6 talking about? Parents discipling their children and teaching them all of these things that the Lord has commanded. Why? By the way, if there's a generational curse, why would it matter if I teach my children? Hmm? Riddle me that, Batman. Why would it possibly matter if we're all just doomed because of generational curses? I, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but I know for a fact that right here, right now, under the sound of my voice, there are people who are influenced by this thinking. Because I know all out there, people are influenced by this thinking. And not only is it grossly unbiblical thinking, but it is actually a form of idolatry. Charms have no power. Curses have no power. When Jesus rose from the dead, he came to his disciples, and when he gave the Great Commission, it began with all power in heaven and on earth is given unto me. If Christ has all power in heaven and on earth, where's the room for the charm to have power? Where's the room for the witch doctor to have power? Where's the room for the curse to have power? Christ has all power. And we worship him and him alone. We bow down to him and to him alone. We do not try to appease other powers. Because there is only one power. And it is God in Christ. That is the power that nailed our sin to the tree. That is the power that died and went into the grave. That is the power that three days later rose from the dead in order to demonstrate its power. There is no power anywhere else. All power is his power. All power is his power. All of it. All of it. And everything else that you see out there, every dark thing that you see out there, the world, the flesh, and the devil, but what about him? Isn't he the prince of the power of the air? Listen, we talked about Luther earlier. And I may not agree with Luther on worship, but I agree with Luther wholeheartedly on this quote. Even the devil is God's devil. Did he just go get Job? No. He had to ask. Because all power is God's power. Don't make graven images. Don't, don't, don't make things. In other words, don't give over your heart to these things. Don't bow before these things. Don't let these things dictate what worship is supposed to look like. God dictates what worship is supposed to look like. And then remember, remember, God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God which means he leaves no room for anyone and anything else on the throne that belongs to him. He can't. For him to do so would be a form of idolatry. There's no room for anyone or anything else on the throne that he occupies. Not even you. Not even you. Don't be afraid of false gods. Don't be enamored with false gods. Don't be deceived by false gods. We worship the one true and living God. And we worship him only. And we worship him rightly. Let's pray.
Oh, God, how we thank you for your goodness and kindness and mercy toward us in Christ Jesus. How we thank you that you have not left us to perish in our sin. How we rejoice in your forgiveness, in your mercy. How we rejoice in the goodness and majesty of Christ. How we rejoice in the sufficiency of his sacrifice. And how we rejoice in the beauty of his worship. Grant by your worship, grant by your your grace that we might worship God alone. That we might do so rightly, that we might do so reverently, that we might do so regularly as you command. Thank you for reminding us today that there is no God but God. And that we are to fear, serve, worship, or pledge our allegiance to anyone or anything else. Grant that our worship of you might be pure. And grant this, we pray, in Christ's name and for his sake.